Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, delighted to be here. Well, being British and having stayed up. I'm not sure what you said. That's you. <laughs> I know, and my volume's off. I said, sorry, I'm not sure what you said. Um, so much for tweeting this. Put it on airplane mode. Um, uh, as, as I was about to say, that uh, not such a delight if you're British and were up late, late last night hoping for a different kind of hung parliament and then waking up to discover that the Ulster Unionists are in power. That's not a, it's not a, one, it's not a wonderful way. But, you know, we have, we did a panel last year, A Tale of Two Cities, um, on much the same theme, not because we lack imagination, but because this is a mm -hmm. very, very important modern theme. Um, the economic segregation of cities, the political divide between cities and everywhere else, uh, the fact that in, in the last year, Claudio was on the panel, but uh, it, it, since that time, we've all obviously had Brexit, Trump, we've had um, Istanbul outvoted in the Erdogan referendum, and then again, London last night outvoted. So it keeps happening, and there's a reason for it, and there is a, a political divide to match the economic divide between the city uh, and the rest. And, and so this morning, for me personally, is a particularly good time to talk about that. We've got a, we've got a wonderful panel. It's um, entitled after Richard Florida's uh, really great new book, uh, The New Urban Crisis, um, uh, which I'm gonna sort of kick off with. And Richard um, needs no introduction, uh, a great urban guru, author of The Rise of the Creative Class, um, and founder of City Labs, resident of Toronto. Uh, and uh, we will sort of frame the discussion around your book. Um, to, to Richard's uh, left is Mark Hoplomazian, who's the chief executive of Hyatt, um, uh, a Chicagoan, um, also a veteran of um, such panels. <laughs> um, so delighted to have you here, Mark. Thanks. Valerie, of course, needs no introduction, former senior advisor to, to President Obama, former City Hall um, bigwig here in, in Chicago, Good and morning. many other things. Good morning. Um, Dennis Misner, to, to Valerie's left, is the founder of the uh, Lemon Foundation um, in Sao Paulo, which promotes uh, high quality education for, for Brazilian children, but also the, the um, uh, originator of the anti-gun violence and the gun control movement in Brazil. Uh, and then, uh, last but not least, uh, Claudio Orego, um, the governor of the Greater Santiago region, in, in Chile and a former presidential candidate, first runner up, I believe. <laughs> um, so a really, a really great panel. Um, but I want to start with you, Richard. Uh, so you, 15 years ago, uh, had a very, very optimistic vision of the cities being uh, places that were about human capital and human talent and um, uh, creative industries being on the rise and this sort of virtuous circle of attracting better people with more progressive values, being good for the economy and, and the growth of a new, uh, a new kind of city. Now, you're saying it's kind of succeeded too well, that the cities you know, are, are, are thriving, they're booming, the creative industries are increasingly urban, uh, but that's producing an economic segregation that uh, is pricing a lot of people out and of course leading to the kind of populist backlash we're talking about electorally. T talk us through why that's happened um, and, and we'll get into later um, how we can fix it, but just, just why that's happening. Sure, and, and thank you by the way, Ed, for writing an incredibly thoughtful and lucid, you, you need not read my book, you only need read his review that's and conversation true. in the FT. It is a brilliant synopsis and a thoughtful uh, honestly and candid, thoughtful synopsis and, and review of the book. So um, I, I just want to say one thing before I get to the creative class. Um, I was born in Newark, New Jersey in 1957. I saw Newark when it was a thriving, bustling, uh, multiracial, my parent, my mom went to an integrated high school. Um, I saw it when it had great department stores and a functioning downtown and great neighborhoods, middle class neighborhoods. And I was there during the Newark riots and, and actually a story I tell in the book is we heard shooting, and my dad told me he had an old Chevrolet Impala to get down on the floor of the Impala and zoomed us out of there. I saw tanks in the streets, I saw armored vehicles, I saw police, and I really, I think that experience of the old urban crisis, that's the point that I was forged as an urbanist by understanding the decline of my city. My dad was a factory worker, I saw the factory where he worked become deindustrialized and closed, I was a 
high school student graduating when New York was bankrupt. So I guess my first impression, if we quote Jen, Jane Jacobs, was not the death and life, but the death of great American cities. Uh, then I think by moving to New York and then going to Pittsburgh, that's where the idea of the creative revival came from. I began to see as a graduate student in New York, punks and artists and musicians and all these people reviving cities. And I was like, a city can come back? Come on, that, that's impossible. And then in Pittsburgh, of course, I forged the idea there was this group of knowledge workers, techies, entrepreneurs, and innovators. And Ed, to, be, to your point, I, I was very optimistic because for all of my life, cities were declining. And, you know, remember writing this in the late 1990s, we, we, we only began to saw a trickle of urban revival. Valerie was doing it here, of course, but we could see a trickle of people coming back to Pittsburgh and saw more of New York and more in San Francisco and more in Boston and more in Chicago. And so I think I was very optimistic that our cities could come back. And, and to your point, um, I very much underpredicted the extent of the urban revival. I, 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 I hoped it could occur, but really when you look at the data, um, it really occurs from the point of 2000 to now is when we see this sweeping movement of and, and you know the creative class, knowledge workers, highly educated people, and the statistic that's quite pointed is the top 10% of income earners have come back to cities and the bottom 10% of income earners have left cities. What, what I think is distinguishing about the new urban crisis from the old is the old urban crisis really was the flight of the middle class and jobs and investment to the suburbs. And the city became the proverbial hole in the donut. The new urban crisis, there's many dimensions of it I could talk about, it, geographic inequality, winner take all cities, superstar cities, but at the bottom of it is the fact that our middle class neighborhoods are being eviscerated. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, 70% or 75% of Americans live in a middle class neighborhood in the year 1970 and now uh, less than 40% do. Mm. In 203 of 229 metros, the middle class has declined. Um, and and we're, we're, we're forging ourselves into small areas of concentrated advantage in the urban center, but also in the suburbs, surrounded by much larger spans of concentrated disadvantage in the urban center, of course, uh, and in the suburbs as, as poverty has moved out and distress. And that is causing the backlash. I, uh, we were talking about this. It's not something we're just seeing in the United States. We're seeing it all over the world. And that backlash is a backlash of people who feel left behind, but, but also not just economically left behind, threatened by the values of globalism, of multiculturalism, so of that, diversity and inclusion. That poem, um, ro ro Roses are red, violets are blue, I'm a creative here to displace you. Um, that's, that seems to sort of summarize, this is a very progressive class, but the gentrification going on. Valerie, you've got great experience both at the federal and the city level. Um, how important is it that we get mixed income housing right? And where, and, and where is getting it right? I think it's very important that we get it right. And uh, my experience here in Chicago beginning in the early 90s was to, and this is when Mayor Daley was in office, was to strategically target resources that we had at the city level as well as at the state and federal level, but also importantly with the private sector so that you were working with private developers to go into communities that had a lot of vacant land because there had been a lot of abandoned buildings that had been demolished, and we started looking at that land as an asset. And so if we could make the land available for a dollar, it would induce developers to come and bring down their costs and try to create affordable housing, use the public dollars for very low income housing through tax credits and public housing resources, and then draw in the private sector uh, market rate homes uh, because it's tied to an amenity. So whether it's near the University of Chicago or out by the West Side Stadium, what are, the, what are the amenities, the anchors, the job creators that will draw people in? And then when I joined the Habitat Company, and I see Daniel Levin, the chairman here, uh, we were the receiver for the Chicago Housing Authority. And there we were working again with federal resources to try to tear down these large um, tracts of uh, public housing mm -hmm. and take advantage of then you have not just sporadic vacant lots but a big track of land and use that again with the private sector developers to build mixed income housing with the thought that that's what really stabilizes a community and that these isolated pockets of low income housing do not lead to upward mobility. There are not job opportunities in the neighborhoods that have those high concentrations. The schools tend to suffer dramatically, and that's one of the major reasons people move out of the cities, is they're looking for good schools. 
There are no parks, there are no jobs. We talked last night about the fact that you need to have economic development. People have to go to the grocery store and the dry cleaners and have all of those amenities and open space. And so we tried to create communities that would be communities that people who have choices would elect to live in. And so we looked at it from that perspective. So, I mean, there is an irony here that people like us who do well and live in cities and have a, an internationalist mindset um, are, are essentially unconsciously, unwittingly, um, pricing others out. That, that there's a new kind of segregation, an economic segregation that's going on. That we, um, the phrase opportunity hoard, we opportunity hoard social capital for our children, mm -hmm. best schools, who of course live in their most expensive areas with uh, property taxes that can fund good schools. How radical do you think the intervention needs to be to get this mixed income housing? Because there are a lot of there's a lot of efforts around, but there's nothing transformative on the horizon, in America at any rate. It requires a deep subsidy. And the other important factor that you have to consider, and it's one of the issues we kept raising when we were in charge of the bricks and mortar resources at the Habitat Company, is along with that, you also have to invest in social services and job training, and as I said before, education. And so it's not just about building housing or even just building um, any kinds of bricks and mortar, you have to have jobs, you have to have good schools, you have to have social services. And if you don't have that component of it and you simply focus on the physical space, then you're not gonna have a sustainable, successful community. And there are examples around Chicago and cities all over our country where resources with the best of intentions went in and stabilized the housing market and then basically recreated horizontally what you try to get rid of vertically. And that's not a mixed income healthy community. So, so one of the ways, Claudia, one of the ways that you know, um, is uh, uh, providing a solution, at least a partial solution to this, is not to have city governments and then surrounding counties and suburbs separately governed, but to have one large area, the city, the suburbs, the rural counties, all under one democratic, which describes the, the Santiago region. You're not mayor of Santiago, you're governor of the Santiago metropolitan region, right? How, how does that change your job um, from if you had been just mayor of Santiago. How, does, how, do, how do you take other people's, I guess the losers, or the left behinds, or the far, further flung interests into well, account? Well, actually I was mayor of one of the boroughs of Santiago for, mm -hmm. I don't know, eight years. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that it, most of the challenges, you know, poor people face in cities like Santiago, seven million people city, is that they, there are certain things that cannot be solved at a local level. For example, transport, uh, the uh, you know, environment, uh, economic opportunity. Those are the things that are dealt at the metropolitan area. And what happens is that very often, the richer neighborhoods, I mean, they have the money to do whatever they need, highways and investments. For, of course, they don't want jails in their counties. They don't want the garbage dams. You just throw them out in the outskirts where the poor people live. So then you need, if you don't want to be a slave of the NIMBY concept, you need to have a greater authority that will take care of everyone. And it won't, it won't be only subject to those who have a larger, I mean, the greater voice. Uh, so what you see right now, not only in Santiago... So it gives you more power to override the... Absolutely. I mean, and you need to invest, for example, in, in public transit. Uh, and of course, those who have the cars and use the cars, the only thing they want in a city like Santiago or Sao Paulo is a huge highway. Mm -hmm. And we have invested, you know, $5 billion in the late years just to have urban highways in Santiago. And if you were to get to Santiago, and maybe some in the audience have been there, you can feel, you know, if you go from the airport to the higher part of the city, like in Singapore. But if you were to take the public transit, you know, a bus from the outer part of Santiago where the poor people live, it may take you two hours. So then, how do you have the political power mm -hmm. to make the hard decisions and to make investments where the, lar the majority of the people live but they have less voice in the system. You need a greater authority. And the OECD just uh, issued a study this year uh, analyzing 200 different metropolitan areas in the OECD realm. And it shows something that is very obvious, but I think it's very important to take into account, that those who have a stronger metropolitan governance structure are more equitable and are more economic uh, productive. 
Uh, so when you're seeing this economic divide in cities and you're thinking of how do you make this new uh, quality stand, urban quality standards or urban rights for everyone in the city, uh, you need the power, the political power, in order to implement them and to allocate the resources where they need to be allocated. For example, in Santiago, we had made 11 parks the last two and a half years, mm -hmm. all of them in poor places. We know we cannot overcome social and income inequality in a four year period, but we can make a difference in urban standards in four years. So uh, I, when you mentioned social uh, and income inequality, I, I, I turn to the Brazilian on the, on the stage. Um, <laughs> Uh, Sao Paulo, in particular, is an incredible city of divides. Uh, the political division between urban Sao Paulo and the favelas around is just as big, in a way, isn't it? What, yeah. How are you looking at that? What, what would be the way of uniting the interests of the greater region? So I'm, while everyone is speaking here, I'm thinking about this. I think we're talking about segregation, we're talking about inequality, we're talking about the rise of a creative uh, class and you know what that happens. I mean, they're very progressive, but they are creating also inequalities just by occupying some of the spaces and capturing those spaces. And I think this combination of inequality and agenda setting, I think, is what we should uh, be discussing. Like, who sets the agenda? We just went through mayoral elections last year in Sao Paulo, and the mayor was a left uh, party, very progressive, very modern, uh, uh, independent thinker. And he basically, all his agenda, the main points of his agenda were getting more uh, bicycles in the streets and opening, you know, more uh, closing the streets on weekends so people could have leisure time and make more like walking zones around the city and things like that. And he was like, he got like 16% of the vote. And he lost to all the poor people who normally would vote for the left and the richer center would vote for more of the social democrats. And it didn't, it didn't happen this time. And I think a lot of it is just the agenda setting for a smaller and smaller part of the population is this, you know, environmentally friendly and open city and, you know, more diverse city. And you have a, lo a lot of people who are not against necessarily uh, this agenda, but who just feel that the most important issues are not that. Right. The most important issue are not about putting bicycles mm -hmm. in the streets or, or making it you know, nicer on the weekends, but it's about spending three hours in the bus to get your job or having no jobs or the health system being in failure in the poor areas of the city. So I think we, we try to read that as we used to read maybe five years ago in terms of left and right or conservative and uh, progressives. I think it's actually getting a little bit more complicated. And I think that's why we're getting so wrong a lot of the predictions for the elections is there's a new modern contemporary agenda that doesn't speak to a lot of people. And this is but a big part of the news, a big part of public debate, a big part of conferences. And it's really, really important, but we have to connect this to the more, you know, other issues that are affecting the majority of the population in our urban areas. So Mark, I'm going to get to you in a second, but Richard, just, just to sort of mention some examples here. Off, off the top of my head in America, Indianapolis sort of took, is, is a model, right? Because it did take in the surrounding counties, whereas Cleveland, what do they call it? The mistake by the lake. Um, it's a great city though. A great city, sorry. <laughs> rock and roll, rock and roll. Um, <laughs> Cleveland is the o opposite end of the spectrum. Wh where would you look at in terms of this kind of OE the, the, what Claudio was talking about, OECD sort of model? Well, first I want to address the, the other point mm -hmm. about the, the backlash, you know, and Toronto has metropolitan government, um, and that metropolitan government elected a crack mayor named Rob Ford as part of exactly the backlash you said, um, a multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalition uh, not white working class, as in the United States, of people who felt left behind. But the, so, so the, point, the two points I want to make is one, I think it's a mistake to draw a division between making a city better and enhancing the quality of life through parks and open space and bike lanes, which reduce uh, deaths, pedestrian friendliness, and equity issues. I think they're part and parcel of the same I agree. thing. And I think what, what's happened is, in, in fact, those left behind are not just voting with their pocketbook, they're voting with values and culture. They're very threatened by the value system of my creative class or our creative class, which is multicultural, multi-ethnic, diverse, progressive, pro-gay rights, and they have more traditional family values. So we have to address that on multiple levels, and, and the left needs a progressive and inclusionist agenda, no doubt. The question that I have, and it's, it's, I don't have an answer, 
is I think metropolitan government can cut both ways. And, and this is what, and I think I see this from my, my experience in Toronto. In Toronto, one could argue, I, I, and I'm not making this, one could argue that the metropolitan government, in, in, of the in, inclusion of the old suburbs, created a situation where the progressive left has lost power and ceded power to a conservative, not populist now, but a conservative a mayor and a conservative agenda. So although it, it can create equity, and it creates much greater efficiency, my worry is that it also sometimes creates a, a political dynamic which might be, in, in a way, against urbanism, more broadly speaking. I just wondered what, if you had a reaction to that. Well, it really depends on what you de define by suburbs. Uh, in the case of Santiago, the poor people live in the suburbs. Yep. Same I mean, it's increasingly the case here. Because what happens is that, you know, because the land price is going up, yep. If you want to have public housing, so I mean, the main ghettos, social ghetto, urban ghettos That's of so Santiago nice. were created by the state, because we just bought cheap land in the outskirts of the city. We just put the people there. They were happy for the first two years. Now we're demolishing them. Exactly. They, they were have no jails. There were no. There was no urbanism. It was only housing. And, and now uh, we have market-driven ghettos in the downside, because everyone wants to be Smart. as close to the center, not only the millennials, but also the poor people that were living two hours mm -hmm. away from the city, they want to come back. Mm -hmm. So now the market is providing, you know, yep. uh, 20 uh, square kilometers uh, <laughs> departments mm -hmm. with, you know, 3,000 departments in one building with three elevators. And so I think the role of a metropolitan government is to Plan the city, really. Um, there, this is the moment for city planning, more than ever. More than ever. And that is not only zoning, but also managing. City planning means, I mean, do, do you, you have to take on vested interests, right? You have to take on the luxury condo developers. You have to take on people who want to keep. I, I, absolutely. The thing, I mean, you have to, for example, what we're doing right now in Santiago, where the state is buying pieces of land to make this mixed building. Mm -hmm. The market would never do it. Right. And just by you know, uh, giving vouchers, as we have done for the last 40 years, with a very successful uh, scheme in one sense, you, will, you only will get you know, poor people living with poor people. Right. Yep. You need to buy the land that is in a good location, you know, closer to transport, closer to health, closer to education, and then promote the mixture. Market or state hand by hand would I never I sense we're all we're all as we often do with urban conversations driving towards a hosanna to Singapore at some point because of course Singapore doesn't have surrounding hinterlands but it, it isn't much of a democracy and you've got to be you've got to steamroller people to get this stuff done Mark you're the principal private sector I mean you're the private sector voice on this panel but you're also as head of Hyatt you're um, a global city brand um, par excellence. You, you're in most of the big global city, almost all of them. Um, and you can hire people and transfer them. And why should you care about the fact that there's these great inequalities? Surely it actually is good for business. Um, well, I guess first and foremost, I care because um, it, uh, it, it does have uh, impact on people's perceptions about uh, cities that they're traveling to. Um, we, we're living in, in the reality of um, labor markets around the world, and um, we consistently see that these, um, these divides are, are not healthy for the communities, um, and they're not healthy for our own colleagues. So as we think about extending a sense of care for our own colleagues um, and having them engage with guests who are coming from around the world, but also uh, from local markets, um, it's really in incredibly important for them to have a good quality of life um, as opposed to showing up extremely stressed about their situation. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, we're talking about cities versus outside of cities. Uh, our experience is that within cities, you have this bimodal distribution of, uh, of uh, wealth, income, opportunity, skills. Um, our industry is unique, uh, well, I don't know if it's unique, but it's, a, it's special in the sense that we, we can employ people with very limited skills, and we can actually give them career paths. And so our focus has really been to um, try to play a role in being more proactively engaged in bringing people out of uh, the most disadvantaged areas in the cities in which we're operating and put them to work in jobs that are actually accessible to them 
and then um, help them grow and progress. So a couple of specific examples in um, uh, both Sao Paulo, but also most recently in Rio, we opened a hotel and we, we, we started an outreach um, through an organization, local organization to local favelas. And uh, today, our hotel, which opened about a year ago, um, uh, more than 10% of the staff in that hotel is from uh, local favelas. Now, uh, and we've done similar things in Chicago, for example, trying to reach into the community through organizations, partner organizations. What we've learned um, is that uh, the, the keys to success there um, really relate to something Valerie mentioned earlier, which is there is a housing issue, um, but it is a more holistic it, uh, approach that you need to think about. Social services is critical. A lot of the young people that we are trying to employ have parents or siblings that are incarcerated. They've got um, other challenges within their households. They've got, they are many times, even at, um, it, it's still in their teens, the primary breadwinner for the household. Um, you're talking about a very stressed situation. Secondly, I would say transportation is a part of that equation. So social services, transportation, and finally, uh, finding opportunities to give them uh, paths to skill sets. So one of the things that happened in Chicago is all of the library system was wired for Wi-Fi access. So you now have nodes of access for broadband um, in local communities. And using those, leveraging the, that network is really critical. We ran a program with Khan Academy about 18 months ago here in Chicago where we tried to enlist a huge number. We had a, over 100,000 students involved in this uh, math challenge. And the key, uh, to, to success there was actually enlisting the, the public libraries and, and of course CPS and the other uh, school districts around the, uh, around the area to work collaboratively and figure out how to get these students access to the broadband that they needed in order to actually participate. So I look at this and say it's a very, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a holistic sort of environmental ecosystem that you need to... Uh, so to just, just, just to pick one example, I mean most, many people here are staying at the Park Hyatt. Yep. Um, here, um, including me. Um, thank you. And yes, well, no, no, thank you. I thank just you. got up, upgraded to a, to a suite. So it was a little wonderful. Hotel. You deserve it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Clearly, I, I approve thoroughly. Um, but talk, talk about how Park Hyatt here yep. um, uh, employs and helps disadvantaged people. So we've, we've um, worked with a couple of organizations in Chicago. Um, one organization that actually uh, their, their mission is to bring people who are homeless into jobs. And so we've got um, employees both at the Park Hyde and the Hyde Regency Chicago who came through that mm -hmm. program. We've got, um, we work with a couple of other specific organizations, uh, companies, uh, organizations uh, like Europe or City Year or Urban Alliance. And their mission is to, is to work with young people, mostly in school, but there's a huge population of young people who are actually out of school and out of work. And that's actually a, a separate problem and an issue that is, I think, Indeed. critical to address. So they're out of the system, but um, a lot of the other organizations are working with kids that are in school and giving them job experience early to do two things. One is uh, obviously give, give them uh, experience and, and, and uh, exposure um, and uh, a path to income as well. But they're doing it at the high school uh, in high school at that age or uh, just after high school as a means to um, sort of uh, point to a future that is not apparent if you're living in, uh, in a neighborhood where the, there are no jobs or um, uh, there, there's, so a, there's a high crime rate. What, one of the elements, Valerie, one, one of the sort of elements that is more euphemized than spoken about directly of gentrification is, is, is the race factor. And I mean, Chicago is a pretty good example. There is an outflow. Um, of African Americans, more successful African Americans to the South. And there's this phrase I keep hearing that I hadn't heard before of reverse black migration to the South, people going to Atlanta, people going to other parts of the South. Um, and of course we have um, in, in different forms uh, racial impacts going on everywhere. Sao Paulo would be a very good example as well. Um, is this a problem? Um, and if it's a problem, how do we address it? Well, first of all, let me say, I still think Chicago is the greatest city on earth, and I bet half this audience like, would agree with you. me. Yeah. So, um, and, and I think mobility is 
important. I think what's good is that people are able to move around and find um, opportunity, and my guess is most people who move to cities like Atlanta, which is another great city, um, are going because of opportunity. And maybe there's a cohort, cohort that they feel comfortable with, and word of mouth. I mean, most people move in patterns where they know someone who lives in a place, and then they say, hey, it's great down here, and then mm -hmm. the next thing you have more people going. So I think that the challenge, though, here is what are we going to do to make sure that our city is safe? Two things, safety and better schools. And that takes money. And unfortunately, uh, because we have, in my opinion, a dysfunctional state government that hasn't passed a budget in a couple of years, the normal resources that might flow from there um, are stagnant. And now you have a federal government that isn't really interested in investing in cities. And so you have another challenge there. And you cannot do the kind of investment you asked me about early that's going to really make a difference without a big serious public investment. Mm -hmm. And I use the word investment rather than spending because that's what it is. And mm -hmm. the long-term benefits of that investment in public transit, in housing, and in infrastructure are going to be what makes the city healthy and that will ultimately grow the tax base. But for the citizens of Chicago that just went through a tax increase, everybody's already feeling stretched. And we're just coming off of a um, cataclysmic economic meltdown. And so, it's very difficult to imagine how you can do that without a federal partner infusing a lot of money. The private sector, the civic community here in Chicago in the private sector is better than any I've ever seen across this country, and I've been all across this country. And so that private investment and, and desire to enhance our city and to look around at a lot of our amenities, they're paid for in part by the private sector, that's still not enough. And in a minute, I want to get onto the Obama um, found at library, um, but as an example, but Richard, sorry, you wanted to. No, I just, I want to pick up on the bridge between Valerie's, because I agree with Valerie 100%, but, but clearly that's not going to happen. It's not just your state that has uh, dysfunctional, the conservatives, not Republicans, control a majority of state legislatures, and those policies, for as far as we can track them, have been anti-urban. These are not new, these are long-running. So what can we do in the short run? And I think Mark has given me great hope and optimism. I was so taken by what you said. Um, the urban revival of the past decade and a half was driven in large measure by local activity. I'm not saying we should, we should have more federal and state investment, but what really did it was local actors, civic organizations, as you said, Valerie, but anchor institutions. Anchor institutions like great universities, great medical centers, but I would add anchor institutions like great corporations, uh, real estate developers and particularly high-tech companies. And I think the, the real agenda in the short run has to be, and Mark articulated it, how do we engage anchor institutions now, not just in amenity and community betterment and quality of place, but inclusive prosperity on, th on two or three dimensions. The first is we talk about inclusionary zoning, uh, trading developers for the right to develop in big towers to build more affordable housing, to build workforce housing, and really putting the pressure to bear, not being shy about this. Say, you know, if you're going to make a lot of money doing this, you have to come in and be a community partner. Uh, and, and, and also, as you were saying, build, buy up parts of, or, uh, parts of the city that are quite lovely and, and build affordable housing there. Uh, the second piece of it is, as you mentioned, is investing in quality public space and disadvantaged locations that everyone share. But I think Mark put his finger on it, and it was so taken, creating better jobs for low. We've talked about the supply side. Let's talk about the demand side, creating better jobs and better pathways. Who's the biggest employer in Seattle? Amazon. Where are high-tech companies like Google going? What are they building in London? One of the biggest districts of high-tech employment. Who knows better how to create good jobs and innovation than in great high-tech companies? Let's get them involved in creating better jobs, just as you are doing at Hyatt. But let's, let's make this a, a general strategy where the anchor institutions, in order to be part of urban revival, can also be part of inclusive prosperity. It strikes me that your whole story is about human capital. It's where humans want to live, those who are... Um, and human capital is built on good education. Yeah. And good education is about where you live. Can you afford to live there where there are good schools? So it strikes me if you want to tackle this, and sorry, Dennis, I'll, I'll let you jump in one second, but if you, want to, if you want to tackle this, either we change the way we finance schools or we have really good, really good mixed income um, um, schemes. So Dennis. No, I, I want to take exactly this point on education, right? What are we doing? I mean, this is the main focus of our work. Uh, in Brazil, ensuring that every one of the 40 million uh, Brazilian K through 12 students have a great education, and I think this this is not like something that is just 
good to have, like it's nice, it's important to, uh, it's just, it's critical for the development of our countries, right, especially developing countries. We are not going to get to the other side of that in a good way without an education uh, system that is more equitable and that really delivers great education every day. If you look at Brazil and in the U.S., unfortunately, is, is a little better, but not much better. 70% of a kid's grade is explained by the wealth of their parents. Right. Right, so we always all believed oh, yeah. that public education, public free education, was the best way to reduce inequalities and ensure equ equity of opportunity, right? People will be able to compete on a, if we provide basic education to everyone. But we've been providing this for a long time, and still 70% of the success of the kid is based on the parent and not what's happening inside the schools, right? So I think we really, really need to rethink education. I think Khan Academy and innovation is it's a big critical. part of it. We, you know, Brazil is the second largest user of Khan Academy, for example. We have 20 million Brazilians now using technologies that we back to improve education. It's not enough. We have to discuss how to attract better people to the teaching profession, how we can make this more uh, uh, attractive as a profession. We need to rethink the way we're managing the school system, how, the way we're allocating resources, and really transferring money in the school system, like making sure that the school in the poorest neighborhoods are getting the best teachers and are getting the best schooling for the kids, longer school hours, better infrastructure, and that means redistribution of the budget, right, so, of the yeah, school budget. So I think I'm right in saying, Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, that in a poor, um, low income children um, who live in mixed income neighborhoods and therefore go to mixed income schools do way better than children with exactly the same income of course. in concentrated Absolutely. areas. So it's about example, Absolutely. it's about peer um, standards. Um, is, is, is that being addressed in Sao Paulo? Is that being addressed in Santiago? Because I think this is a universal problem. Well, yeah, we're in the midst of a very important and controversial uh, public sector educational reform. But there are some consensus that we have addressed in a country at least. One is uh, the importance of primary education. Uh, people always focus on university, college, what are the six first years of your life? So now we have, a, a, we have just passed a law where we have universal free daycare in the country. Excellent. And, and if you really want to want to go for inequality, I mean, those first six years yep. of your life really make the difference. Yep. Of course, the wealth of the family and the cultural background, but also those first, and right. those you, kids do not you march. You told um, Ivanka Trump about this. Well, she'll, she'll, uh, be, she'll be pleased to hear. Uh, well, well, we'll tell them. Uh, we will tell them the results. But you know, the, the interesting thing is these kids do not march, so the political economy of this reform is not easy because you, you have the same budget. Absolutely. So then, is it just free university for everyone or you allocate some resources for these six first, yeah. first years? And, and when, when it comes to you know, single mother households that want to go out in the market, uh, you don't have this universal free daycare. How are you going to do it? Yeah. And the second thing, I'm going to go back to something you mentioned about the crime. Uh, everyone wants a safe city. Of course, a beautiful city, of course, a prosperous city, but overall, a safe city. Mm -hmm. And very rarely, people link that safe, safety with education. We just discovered a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, by just doing data analysis, that we, we, we thought that dropouts were, weren't a problem in Santiago. Um, but just by crossing the database of the educational system and the health system, we discovered 36,000 kids in my city out of school. Mm -hmm. So you say 36,000 out of 1.8 million is nothing. But when it comes to crime, it can really make the difference. So unless we're able to, I mean, and we have them with names and addresses, and we're going after each one of them to bring them up. Of course, the traditional, a school system is not prepared to deal with these kids. We have some, you know, educational disorder, mental disorder, uh, behavioral disorder, so you need to have a special offer for them. But if you really want to fight crime in our cities, you need to go and be able to guarantee that no one will be left behind. And those kids that are out of school right now are uh, an atomic social bomb for any city in the world. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's an excellent point. Uh, let's go to the sort of other end of the scale, private business. I mean, part of the, part of the success of cities 
is that it is an attractive environment for all kinds of new, new, new economy, orga organized urban knowledge, I think, urbanized knowledge, um, but uh, also more conventional businesses. Um, but to deal with a lot of these problems, you've got to raise revenues. You've got, you, you, you can't all be user fees. Um, some of it's got to come through taxes. Uh, how do you raise, in a, in a city like Chicago, and I'm sort of looking at you three and not throwing it to any, any of you in particular, but a city like Chicago, since we're here, let's stick with this example, um, which has serious public financial problems and, and legacy pension problems. How does it address those, invest in the, in the necessary investments without driving people like you or, or the, um, you know, the, the new economy um, companies that have moved in here or the corporate headquarters that Ram has brought back? How does it square that fiscal circle? Well, right now, I think we're required, we are relying heavily on just what Hyatt is doing. And there are manufacturing companies all across the country now who, for example, are funding schools beginning at about sixth grade. And if you enroll in that school, they design the curriculum. And in a sense, they are specking the education tailored to their market so that when you finish the school, you have a job in their company. Mm -hmm. And that is um, what we're doing to supplement, but that's not the solution. It's gonna help a bunch of kids mm -hmm. get jobs right out of school, and that is gonna make the crime go down, and it's gonna be designed in a way, hopefully, where the children see the purpose of their education, that it's going to actually lead to a job. Because let's face it, and if you're in school today in some of our communities here in Chicago, even if you finish high school, you have no expectation of finding a job. It is more likely that you will be in prison than that you will find a job. And so if you know that there's a Hyatt waiting for you, then you're more likely to stay in school. Yeah. So that's a part of the solution, but the, it's, that's going to help a segment. And I'm saying let's do that because every child matters, but it's not the big social policy solution, public policy solution. I would just add one other thing in that um, you're, I'm sure you might have even started it yourself, but um, under Mayor, Mayor Daley, um, uh, this organization called World Business Chicago was kicked off, which now continues on. It's really um, a collection point for corporate leaders in the, in, the, in the city, and the purpose and the goal is to actually make Chicago a more and more attractive place to, to have companies locate. So I think building the base of companies that are based here, that are companies that are doing business here, that are setting up offices and manufacturing and, um, and service centers in the city to help build the base, because your question was about income uh, or revenue. How do you build the revenue? You gotta have a tax base to build the revenue, and the tax base is both people, but also jobs and enterprise. So I think a, a big area of focus, obviously now it draws its lineage from Mayor Daley's time, but really has accelerated this, at this point, is to, is, is to, and one of the definitions of what a global city is all about is, is a, um, is a collection point and a, and a vibrant place for major corporations to have their, their base. Yeah, I, I mean, the one thing that we know is that great companies, knowledge companies, hospitality and tourism companies, don't have a race to the bottom. They're not going to the lowest tax jurisdictions. They're locating in the highest tax jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. so, so they're locating in places like Chicago or London or Toronto or the San Francisco Bay Area because they have a, a mixture of human capital, educational, whatever we want to call it that is, that is attractive to them and their employees. Um, one thing that we have is the sad fact that Valerie mentioned is the federal and state partners are gone. Yeah. So we have to go it alone. And I think there's two things that are important there, one which we've said. Um, we have to call on our private sector partners, and in particular, to make good jobs. And, and, I, and I want to say this, you know, the good jobs that were created in America and the UK and the advanced countries were partly as a result of public policy, lar maybe largely, but the fact that manufacturing corporations undertook to make factory jobs good jobs. They were shitty jobs. My dad had a shitty job when he was a kid, 13 years old. By the time he came back from World War II, that same job was a good job. The New Deal, the Wagner, I could go down the list, but, but manufacturing companies said if we want demand, if we want to grow a society, we have to turn blue collar work into good job. Well, now we have this bimodal distribution. A third of us do knowledge work, creative work, and 50% of us do service work. So we have to work with great companies like Hyatt and many others that are turning that work into better, and, and you guys have real answers that you can help share. When we upgraded manufacturing, it was by taking hub companies uh, like big manufacturers, partnering with their suppliers and teaching them about how to make work better. And then thirdly, I would be remiss not to say this, it's a longer term agenda. We're handing our tax dollars over to the state 
and to the federal government, which is doing what they please with them and not sending them back to us. So over time, I think the longer term agenda has to be to devolve. It's a big process and it's complicated, but to get that devolution, not just of power, but of fiscal responsibility hmm. back to our communities. And, and what I want to say, it's not just for to build a dense knowledge city like Chicago or Toronto. If, if you want to live in a more conservative, sprawling city, if you want to live in a suburb, you should be able to do that. And I think that way of saying you can build the kind of community and vote with your feet, these two divided societies might be able to find a way to coexist. They might be able to find a way to, to say to each other, we can, we can live with each other if we can build the kind of communities we want. So, my name, Claudia, and then is, I'll... Is it, I want to mention something about you know, the corporate responsibility, because it seems to me like we're focusing on you know, uh, give good jobs, train the people, pay your taxes, which mm -hmm. is kind of you know, the basement. Uh, I, I think we're, we're, we ought to be talking something different. What, what is it in cities right now to be, what does it mean to totally. be a good corporate urban totally. neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, neighbor? Uh, and, and I think we need to go from legality to legitimacy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only way, and you were mentioned this, you know, your investment will be sustainable over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned yesterday with, with, uh, in, in our, one of the short words that we have, you know, this uh, big abandoned hospital that we have in a very poor area of Santiago. And there comes this businessman mm -hmm. that wants to transform that potential hospital in a warehouse. Uh, that was a, a bomb, really. But this guy decided to invest one year in community involvement. Uh, he gathered the community within. He asked the community what they wanted, what they need. Now we have the warehouse. Hmm. Everyone is happy with this new neighborhood. Some of the municipal offices are in the warehouse in this huge building. Uh, the community center is there. So investing in community engagement for this monetary investment was the best thing they could do. And that requires a mindset change. It's not only how much money I give for the, I don't know, for Thanksgiving or forever, for a party, it's how do I engage with the community where I'm making my investment? And that, I think, is another way of thinking of the corporate responsibility so besides paying taxes. Legality to legitimacy, I like the way you, you describe that. I mean, Valerie, the, the, the Obama library is gonna be in the heart of the South Side. In yes, High Park, right Jackson on the lake, Park. next to the Museum of Science and Industry. How much of a role can that play in the kind of thing that Claudia has just been talking well, about? Well, I think it will be a model, because another way of saying basically just what you were saying, Claudia, is that the President, President Obama is interested in creating a platform for civic engagement, where people who actually care about not just this city, but communities across our country, rural areas across the world can share best practices of how to solve some of these really big problems. And there are solutions out there, but they may be buried in a kind of a silo. And so how can we bring them to life? And how can we uh, help educate, particularly young people, about what their responsibilities of citizenship are all about? And uh, I was, I was a, with a group of moms who lost their children to gun violence in a show we did earlier a couple weeks ago, and one of the moms said if everyone who had left this community had stayed in the community and been a part of the solution, my neighborhood would be a healthy community. It wouldn't be plagued by gun violence. And so how do we get citizens, private and corporate citizens alike, to understand it is in their self-interest and it is a part of what it means to be a part of a society to care about the poor kid who's going to school and he's disruptive. Why? Because he's hungry or because his parents are not in the home or because in order to get from home to school, he has to go through a potential war zone right here in one of the most affluent um, countries on earth. How could that be? And so the library is designed to create this platform both physically on the south side of Chicago, quite intentionally on the south side of Chicago to make that an economic engine in and of itself and a draw and to bring tourism to the south side of Chicago and solutions being developed in that incubator right next to the University of Chicago, which will be an important partner in this. But also, what are we gonna do to connect people all over the world to those solutions? So, so having a virtual platform in addition to a physical space. And there are big, big challenges, there's no doubt. But we can solve those challenges if we can figure out how to get more people involved in being a part of the solution and feeling the corporate responsibility, feeling the individual responsibility that we all do to be sitting around this table talking about this issue. So uh, it was great to have private civic initiatives like that, but it seems 
that there's a consensus that we need more planning, that we actually need more planning. Richard, is that the right direction to go? Is it politically feasible to talk about more planning? I think it depends on yeah. what you consider planning, and, and I understand how Claudio used the word. It's not the top-down imposition of planning. You know, there's this classic essay uh, by Turner called Housing as a Verb. Right? The planning has been housing as a noun imposed. When housing is a verb, it's built by communities. So I think a word like strategy, an urban strategy, a strategy that involves many people, that's inclusive and engaging. And I want to make just one general point because it's come up so much. We are, and this is why it's so, so important what you're doing, we are in a field that's terribly fragmented and underinvested in. Uh, if you want to be an engineer, there's an engineering school. If you want to go to business, there's a business school. If you want to be a doctor, there's a medical school. This field of educating people how to be good citizens and good urban neighbors, that can be a curriculum in primary schools, but it's not. And, and kids want to be engaged in their neighborhood. That could be a project in high schools. That could be a whole curriculum. We have urban planning and architecture and a little bit of civil engineering. There can be a whole school to, to train people how to do this. And I think if, if we're going to build what, many more cities spend billions, put more billions of people, trillions of dollars. We really need a much broader commitment. Along the lines, Claudia said, it's, it's not just being about a good citizen, it's about how to engage, how to do that construction. I'll just tell you one story. Working with an anchor institution in, in Philadelphia that was very concerned, very concerned about students not being good neighbors, right? The, the, the students of our school and other schools are going into these neighborhoods and they're acting crappy. They're having parties, they're disrupting things. And I'm just dumb, so I said, do you ever think about starting a course for every entering student called the City 101? And just exposing them through a course on what it's like to build a city, live in a city, and I'll bet you they'll get it. And they were like, that's a wonderful idea, but I, but I think this is a long process of actually inculcating these ideas and theories across the board of our society. If I could just add uh, something and re refer back to your warehouse story, which is beautiful. Um, I think uh, this idea of having um, a strategy that's more inclusive and, and more engaging is critical. Um, exposure and real knowledge of what's actually happening is essential. I think what I see in so many cases with respect to more on the public policy side as opposed to not-for-profit organizations engaged in these issues is a lack of the application of real empathy. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, you described someone who invested a year before they took action. What were they doing? They were immersively understanding what, from the point of view of the people that they were going to, going to be impacting, what was actually happening with them. Arnie Duncan, um, who's um, obviously most recently the um, Secretary of Education here in the United States, moved back to Chicago, and he, is, he grew up in some of the toughest neighborhoods on the South Side. He's immersively re-engaged himself in trying to address the, the uh, fringe population of the, um, or the, the most at-risk population of these young people who are out of school and out of work. And he, even though he grew up in those neighborhoods, he spent months yes. visiting prisons and going to their homes and talking to their parents and their siblings and really understanding what was going on. And what he's designed, so I, I met with him and I said, how can we help? And I said, um, maybe we can start, uh, we can offer a job to uh, some of your, the kids that you're uh, trying to have an impact on. He said, nope, can't do that. You need to offer five. And I said, I don't understand. He said, they need a cohort to be with one another mm -hmm. because the, uh, the old mm -hmm. model is you take a young man or young, mostly young men and you pull them into a workplace and you, you find a particularly sympathetic character and you mm -hmm. make them a mentor, or you make them a partner. That person, no matter how sympathetic they might be, d cannot relate to what mm -hmm. they have lived through. Mm -hmm. um, at 15 years old, having a gun thrust in your hand, having to kill someone to prove your worth to the gang that you just joined is not something that people can relate to. So he said, what we found, and this is after months of immersive application of empathy, he said, you need to have a, self, a support group there. And that's actually the most effective way forward. That's very simple, but only can come from the kind of immersive activity. So I would say elevating empathy and the practice of it in, in how we actually enlist resources, I think, is essential. So we're going to go to questions in a moment. Um, uh, but Dennis, I want, I, mean, I want to bring a little bit more the gun situation. Again, you're from Sao Paulo, but we're in Chicago, and it's a big debate. What have you learned? What lessons 
do you have from Sao Paulo that can be applied elsewhere, such as here, in terms of controlling and reducing gun homicide? Well, the, the first thing is when we started uh, working with gun control uh, 18 years ago in Sao Paulo, well, 20 years ago, actually, this year uh, in Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo had a homicide rate of 50 homicides per 100,000, which is double what Chicago has today, right? Today, Sao Paulo has a, a homicide rate of seven homicides per 100,000, which is what almost... What period? Sorry, what was the number? 18 years. 50. Eight, 20, 20 years, 20 right? Years. But in 10 years, there was an 80% reduction in gun violence in Sao Paulo. And that's a very, very important story that it's a bigger reduction than New York uh, in the period is similar to some of the Colombian cases, but we went down a much lower level. And now we've been for a decade on this lower level between 10 and eight, now seven and a half or so. So I think there were three things that were critically important. First thing was exactly what you described in terms of going to the communities. I mean, crime is concentrated, right? Crime doesn't happen everywhere. Crime happens in a few parts of the city. It also happens uh, at certain times, right? Crime was happening, homicides in Sao Paulo, and I'm sure it's the same in many other areas, happen Friday night to Sunday. Uh, you know, it's the weekend. So if you think that's a problem of crime, you have a, you have a, uh, it's wrong, right? Homicide was not, I mean, what is this? People who have a regular job during the week and on the weekend they have a second job as a criminal and go there. It's, it's just not that that's happening, right? What's happening is young kids killing each other. People died, 80% of the kids died one kilometer from their home. It's a radius issue, is meeting at night. So you design your interventions to these problems. And there are a lot of very, I mean, micro is was a big import, uh, important, was just stop and frisk near the bars and the concentration areas where you just tell people, get rid of the gun. You cannot have a gun Friday night, Saturday night. Then we, we were able to pass legislation. It's hard to debate this in the US, but national legislation, a disarmament statute that banned carrying guns in Brazil. This has been done in 2003. Uh, and a lot of important legislation came through. It's a big battle uh, still going on, but major changes happened there. Lastly, you had community policing and targeted investments to get kids offer alternative role models to kids, right? You have to show that being a drug dealer is not the only way to be popular in your community. Being a drug dealer, joining a gang is not the only way to feel like you're part of something. You have to offer alternative programs in terms of social programs, in terms of how the school is dealing with that. And you have to denormalize the idea that you can solve your problems by killing each other. And these are all like, these are extremely complex uh, issues, but it can be done, right? And, and uh, when you start seeing the result, you change in one generation, this is going to be different. See, the banning guns thing here is pretty crucial, right? Yeah. No, um, can, can I just one, one, one thing. Uh, you're talking about Sao Paulo. I just want to mention our Colombian friends from Medellin. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, they created the concept of ur social urbanism where they uh, understand that you know, the crime issues were not only related with drugs, but also with the environment, the neighborhood where the people live. Yeah, yeah. So what you were saying, for me, uh, means that you need a lot of leadership, political leadership, of course. to address this, because it, it, it requires not only strong laws mm -hmm. uh, and control, but also a new approach. I mean, people in the US and everywhere think that crime is only being fought through jails and police. Mm -hmm. So to bring the, into this issue, uh, this equation, education, urbanism, you know, other, other ways of approaching the issue requires a lot of leadership, as many of the other topics that we have been talking today in terms of you know, a private car versus public transit, you know, uh, one-story house, uh, a more densified city. Th those are tensions that you have in uh, modern cities. But and you need a lot of political leadership you know, to overcome that. It does strike me, it, in, in a way, this, this dovetails a little bit with what you were talking about at the beginning, city authority. I mean, again, Chicago, gun control. There is some gun control in the city, but you just drive across the city border where there isn't gun control, or the state line to Indiana, and, and buy your guns and drive back into Chicago. And so the, the gun control within the city is not much use. If the city has a larger governance area, it can address some of these issues. Now, we've got um, some, some time for questions. Um, why is gentrification a dirty word? Um, shouldn't we be celebrating the improvement of our neighborhoods, Richard? Well, I mean, gentrification is an emotionally loaded term. 
Um, that's not often defined appropriately. Um, and what we've seen over the past, it's, it's actually the much bigger problem is concentrated poverty. About 5% of neighborhoods in urban America have gentrified. And in fact, there's not that much evidence of even direct displacement from gentrification because most gentrification takes place in neighborhoods that were relatively undeveloped. So I think it's become an emotionally laden term for a whole variety of reasons, but, but we need to get over it. And we need to really focus on, I think, the issues that we've been discussing. How do we build inclusive cities? How do we create pathways for employment? How do we make neighborhoods safer? Uh, and do this in a way to build stronger communities. But I think this pitting, you know, you know the other thing that is really interesting to me, that, that a, the case is made, the gentrification, knowledge workers are displacing the poor. If you look at progressive voting, in the United States, what are the metropolitan areas that had the most votes for left-leaning progressive candidates? What, what are the metropolitan areas that had the most votes for Mrs. Clinton? San Francisco, San Jose, Washington, D.C., Boston, the places that many would argue are the most gentrified. Indeed. So I think there's another way to pose this, is that you can build a more inclusive society in which people who do knowledge work and people who do service work can coexist. And I think that's what's so heartening about this conversation. It's getting beyond the simple knee jerk of my city's gentrified to how do I build a city that's more inclusive for all. Um, how, might, how might the gig economy affect cities? How are civic leaders preparing for the workforce of the future? Um, Mark, Valerie. I mean, gig economy is clearly at the heart of the creative industry, but I don't want to ask you every question. You are the urbanist on the panel. How is the gig economy affecting Chicago? Well, I, I don't know if I can address Chicago. I think, you know, as I, as I look at um, how people are working and, <coughs> and um, uh, how they're living, uh, first, you know, bigger question that that might introduce is that what's the impact of cities and settlement in cities over time if you can have that job that you used to have to live in the city to occupy, but now you can live where, literally wherever you want and be connected um, and, and do productive work. So I think actually, the, the, I, don't, I think there's a big prospective uh, demography question about where people settle and, um, and what implications there are. Um, but I, I do think that um, there, is this, uh, there is this human connection and sense of community that's still essential for individuals no matter whether they are um, the, the disconnected physically from, from a work perspective. Um, and at least in our case, you know, we, we don't really have the ability to, we, we utilize gig workers in different ways, mostly in things like a software development or, um, or, or um, uh, shared services environments and things like that. But in terms of the actual service work, that it, you have to be there physically. So it, it doesn't really apply. I think a really good example, actually, we all take Uber. Um, and Uber yeah, is a kind of, left. all right. Yeah, I, I want to mention yeah. this. I want to yeah, mention this. Yeah, right. And you can leave no, a but, tip. But I, I, think, I think this is very important, what, what Valerie interjected. Um, these companies, Uber, Airbnb, which are really in innovating and using the city as a platform to make the city more efficient and more effective, are not necessarily good neighbors, to go back yeah. to Claudio's point, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, for them to wake up and to learn from you. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think this is a big thing, that, that a point that needs to be made. You have to be a good urban citizen. If, if you're gonna do business in our town, you have to be treating okay. your workers fairly, you have to be investing in this community. You, and I think, you know, I was listening to you so, so clearly. For many companies and many people, a city is a place to extract things from. You know, this is, you extract coal, you extract oil, you extract whatever, a tax break. What we're saying is there's a new way of viewing the city as something you invest in and support. And I think these gig companies, and they are getting a black eye and they should get a black eye, have a real obligation to be part of this empathetic reinvestment in our community. Well, if let you me take lift, thing. explain why you take lift. Well, I, I, I agree, and it's an interesting new challenge, but there are also advantages of the gig economy. I, I mentioned lift as kind of a joke because I mean, I, I do now have to get around, and I, um, and I use it a lot. And I always talk to the drivers about, well, why do you do it, and what was going on in your life? And many of them say it's a great supplement to their income. It gives them flexibility. Uh, but the question, and you touched on it, is where does the worker's voice come in this? And we had a great summit at the White House a couple of years ago focusing on now that unions only represent 7% of the private sector, 
Where is the collective representation? Yes. How do you ensure that the individual voice is actually represented because it's a soft voice if it's just one and to spirit? And particularly as people are more flexibly located, which is an advantage, but you also kind of lose that impact of the voice. And I think that the companies that will be sustainable over the long term that are in this gig economy are gonna be the ones that are socially responsible, do give their workers a voice, do, do figure out creative ways of creating this collective unification of, of the perspective and do blend the two. I mean, I always thought that the unions that were the most, the companies that were most successful were ones that had good relationships with their unions and where they see this. Which is why you choose Lyft over um, Uber because they treat their contract employees better. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, this is just me having talked to a bunch of drivers now, is that they do feel that they have a better treatment and a better experience. And obviously, Uber has had some other big challenges of late, and the question will be, do they learn from those challenges, and are they able to turn their company around? And I think they've learned the hard way, the consequences of making some of those tough decisions early on of, you know, let me see what I can get without feeling that social contract. Well, and I, I would just add one quick observation. I don't want to get into um, choosing sides with respect to brands, but there was a recent story, uh, very recent story, about a category of drivers from one of those two companies being underpaid persistently over a long period of time. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Um, is this is women, if, women at Uber, is it? Or no, it was it was drivers in, drivers in New York City. Oh, okay. There was a, yeah. there was a systemic right. mistake. Uh, it, right. through, through which they were underpaid. Can you imagine for a moment uh, how, what, it would, what damage it would do to our brand if we showed up and said, oh, by the way, we actually underpaid systemically a whole category of people in our company. I mean, the moral indignation and the outcry would be unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, I just think that, you know, we, that would be a, a massive existential crisis for us as a company, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it's, it's a reflection of how we think about our colleagues and the care that we uh, want to extend to them and helping them be their best in their lives. I mean, that's really crazy to end up in a situation in which something like that could occur, but the, the, the negative backlash should be resounding because that's really... But it's not because we all use Uber. Or, I mean, some use Lyft, but if it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a call to convenient. action. I think I just yeah. want to just reiterate what, what both um, Valerie and, and Richard said. It's a call to action, like pay attention start to really pay attention to the people who are critical to your business, whether you're, they're your employees or not. I think that's another false distinction that also becomes, mm -hmm. I think, a, a, a contortion within the gig, gig and economy. And the consumer can drive change. Yes. And that's kind of the point mm -hmm. I'm making. I is, agree. is it talk to the people who are providing you services. When you're in a Hyatt hotel, ask the folks, you know, how, how does Hyatt treat you, right? right. And you're going to find yeah. that people are starting, particularly younger people, are much more mm -hmm. socially conscious and willing to kind of put their money where their conscience is. The environmental movement Valor. did a good job with that. Yes. The urban citizenship movement doesn't exist. I don't know if we need a star system or whatever it is, but, but we don't have that signal right. as a consumer of who's a good citizen. But I think a, a point here, just to add exactly to your last point, is one big reason for optimism is just how people who are, I mean, young people coming into the job market, how much they care much more about those issues, right? And we can talk about the city losing the votes, but you can also look at the young versus older votes. I mean, in London yesterday, I think the difference was over 40 points uh, for laborers among younger population and you know, over 65 was 40 points more for the conservatives. Right. And of course, you, you, we've seen this, you know, through life, I mean, people, are more progressive when they're younger, but I think it's very different. If you look at car sales in a lot of, I mean, the, the value associated to a car. I'm 40 years old. When I was 18, getting a car was like the biggest thing. Now you look at 18 year olds in a lot of developed countries and also starting in, in some in Sao Paulo and in Chile, people don't want a car. They, want, they can Uber or Lyft or they can take the subway bike. or bike. And so there are some, uh, I mean, look at the, the, there are a lot of changes, behavioral changes, value changes in terms of the younger generation that I think we're all going to benefit a lot from. And so hopefully this will be a, a driver for, for change and will kind of get all the companies and the politicians to kind of shift a little bit their policies to the 21st century. So consumer behavior, voting behavior too. I mean, one of the great silver linings from last night was the young did vote. Yeah. So uh, the, the jokes about millennials will have to be updated. Um, but, 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 then you need, <laughs> yeah, but, but then you need the challenge, and I right. go back to what uh, Mr. Florida was saying. 
uh, that you need people being engaged in the public really sphere. Yeah. Because I mean, <laughs> if these Minelians change their behavior but do not participate uh, in politics, if they don't vote, if they're only concerned about their right and their personal freedom, but not about their civic uh, responsibility, both urban but also political, then we have a problem. And I think what we're, we're facing in many countries is that we have a new generation of people that have a new way of understanding uh, their role and their freedom and everything, but I'm, I'm not quite sure whether they, we have been successful enough in terms of uh, transmitting to them the values of you know, civic and political engagement. I, if, if you look at what's happening in Brazil, it's very recent. We're in a major political crisis um, for few, some years now. We're, have, we're seeing a surge in young people wanting to be politicians. Like this is like crazy, like young people saying, I'm going to be a politician, I'm going to go. We back uh, a network of people, we call them Lemon Fellows, who are going to dedicate their lives to change the country. This is part of the work the foundation does. Now a big part of them say, we are going to be candidates and other, other people, because they're looking at politics instead of my generation who look and say, yeah, politics is rubbish, I'm going to work for an NGO, I'm going to create a cause or a movement and I'm going to engage. They're saying, actually, if we don't change if we don't enter into right. politics, nothing is going to change big picture. So I'm always optimistic, but uh, uh, I Even think this now. is reason for, for, <laughs> for hope. Yeah. So let, 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 let me end with a, a sort of larger question about the future of cities and our politics. Um, and you can all answer it, but I'm going to pose it first to, to, to Valerie. But just with the proviso, we've got like three minutes left, so quite efficient answers. <laughs> um, you've been in Washington for the last eight years. Um, the Democrats, you know, but sometimes uh, in those eight years were in the majority and sometimes not. But the really striking thing is they are an urban party and <laughs> Republicans are a suburban and small town and rural party. I believe the two largest cities with a Republican mayor are San Diego and Jacksonville, Florida. They just don't run cities. But Democrats don't run states. So we have a massive <laughs> urban, uh, non-urban divide that's reflected now in the parties. How are we going to overcome this? What's, what's going to help us transcend this? Well, one thing is when 43% of the country eligible voters, when 43% of eligible voters don't vote, you have results where perhaps people who don't actually represent the entire country get elected into office. Um, you also had extensive gerrymandering that happened, and that's what led to so many of these states um, becoming um, controlled by the Republican Party. And that started 25 years ago where it was a deliberate effort to go after state seats and then they drew the maps to benefit themselves. Now sometimes the Democrats do that when they're in control and so we do not have the true democracy that we should. And I think civic engagement is a solution. We've got to get people to feel that they have to go out and not just do what we were talking about earlier, but they also have to vote. And they have to find mm -hmm. good people who will represent their interests. And you see, I saw in Washington this huge disconnect between people focusing on their short-term political interests versus what was good for the country. It seems that one other point of consensus on, 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 on this panel is that, at least in the American education system, political literacy um, or, and with, or enhanced civics um, is something people would support. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. We don't teach civics anymore. But, uh, to your point, I mean, I, I think we have to accept the fact that the nation state is overblown and dysfunctional. It was a product of an industrial era. It was the product of an older vertical economy, and it's just out of sync with the demands. And we, we just pushed all the power into this unitary executive, imperial presidency. What is it, 20% of Americans, for give or take, have trust and confidence in their federal government? The highest, lowest on record, the highest number of Americans have trust and confidence in their local government, over 75%. So I think the long-term political movement has to be stop clobbering conservative, liberal, urban, suburban, rural. I've said this before, but I think the real movement we have to engage is to take that power out of the executive and use the vertical separation of powers much better than we have, and not the state to move it, and it's a big, it's a big challenge, it's gonna be a long-run challenge, to move it down to local communities and to give local leaders the fiscal power, not just the political power, the fiscal power and the revenue they need to build, and, and also to be respectful of difference. I, I need to say this in a group of urbanists. Not everyone you, you wants to live an urbanist lifestyle. You know, in fact, the minority of people live in urban areas in the United States, the majority live in suburban and rural areas. 
And we can no longer go around clobbering people to accept urbanistic values. We have to be much more accepting. If we want to live this way and invest that way, that's fine. But we don't want to impose those. And I think that's where the backlash ed comes from. I really think it's, it's folks not even feeling left behind economically. It's feeling folks being sneered at. And if we say, just it's OK to, to live the way you want. You don't share our values. You want to drive a car. You don't want to ride a bike. That's fine. I, I think that's a way that we can get over this divide and, and build at least the ability to coexist and, and also build great cities and communities. Uh, an upbeat note um, on which to end a really fascinating panel. Thank you, all of you. I learned a lot. Thank you.